Our scripture passage this morning comes from John chapter 12. We're jumping ahead a book in the Bible as we continue following the lectionary during this Lenten season. Um, and we're jumping at about a week from today. Next week, Sunday, we'll celebrate Palm Sunday. John chapter 12 happens the night before. So on Saturday night before Palm Sunday, we enter into the story of John. A lot has happened recently in John. John chapter 11, you may recall, is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus. So Lazarus dies, and his, his sisters call Jesus to them, and he calls Lazarus out, and the crowd see, and it's a powerful moment. And then in chapter 12, Jesus comes back to Bethany. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't, this money, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should... She should so try to say that really fast in front of 200 people. She should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect together on your word today, as we come to seek to know you more fully, to understand you, to get into the shoes of your son's disciples, to come to understand your son more completely, we ask that you would speak, that you would speak words of truth and life, of hope and conviction. Father, may you speak, for we, your children, are ready to listen. Amen. You might wonder where Bethany is. Bethany is a small town located right next to Jerusalem. So this is Jerusalem, and that's Bethany. It's about two miles away. If you're walking from Bethany to Jerusalem, you have a bit of an adventure ahead of you, though. You have to climb over the Mount of Olives. We know what happens on the Mount of Olives. And then you go down through the Kidron Valley, and then you go up what feels like a wall, but it's a hill, into Jerusalem through the Sheep Gate, most likely, as you travel up from, from Bethany to Jerusalem. All told, if you're in relatively good shape, in the first century, maybe not for us today, we'd be a little slower, but it's about a half hour walk. Half hour from Bethany to Jerusalem. This is the suburbs of Jerusalem. People in Bethany are going back and forth to Jerusalem all of the time and vice versa. There's a lot of communication back and forth. Bethany is not only close to Jerusalem, it is also the hometown of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They don't just appear in our text today, they appear elsewhere. In fact, this is the house Jesus travels to the most in any of the Gospels by name. It's mentioned more often than any other. We first meet them in Luke chapter 10. Jesus comes to their house, and Martha is busy preparing all of the food, making sure everything is ready, and Mary sits down at Jesus' feet and listens to Jesus teach. If you've ever had a lazy sibling, you know what this feels like. So Martha gets mad. And Jesus replies by defending Mary. He says that Mary has chosen the better path than Martha. That doesn't mean working is bad and sitting is good. But when the text says that Mary sat at Jesus' feet, it's using a technical term in those days to describe a disciple. Disciples sit at their rabbi's feet. One thing we know about rabbis is rabbis don't take women as their disciples. Other thing to know about rabbis is Jesus is a weird rabbi. He violates all the rab rabbi rules. So when he says that Mary is sitting at his feet, he's meaning she's one of my disciples. Not one of the twelve, but one of that broader circle of disciples. Jesus accepts her as a peer among the men in a culture that treated her as less than. That's significant for us to never forget how Jesus treated women in his midst. So that's the first time we meet them. 
Then we meet them again in chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. Lazarus gets sick. Mary and Martha send a message to Jesus that their brother is sick. They say, please come see him. Jesus takes his time and Lazarus dies. He's buried. Jesus finally arrives and Martha comes out to him from the house in tears, weeping for her brother. And she says the most powerful thing in this moment of grief. She proclaims that she knows Jesus is the Messiah. In her grief, she proclaims the truth of who Jesus is. Mary comes out and she runs to the tomb and Jesus comes along. Jesus sees her in her sorrow and he weeps with her. And then he calls Lazarus out from the tomb. The crowds, can you imagine if in Granville you saw someone dead at their funeral and then the next day they're walking down the street? People talked about that for more than just a day or two. It was the talk in Bethany and in Jerusalem for a while. In fact, so many people talked about it that the Pharisees got even more concerned about Jesus and at the end of chapter 11, they basically put a bounty on his head to get him arrested. And then we pick up our story in chapter 12. So it's not surprising that Jesus comes to Bethany and they celebrate. How do you not celebrate when the rabbi who raised your brother from the dead comes back into town? This isn't a little small family party. This is everyone in town is there as they celebrate together. They gather on the night before Palm Sunday. The Sabbath has ended, so now they can do the work of preparing the feast and getting all the food ready. The whole village comes, but there's a bit of a cloud hanging over this celebration. There's the bounty on Jesus' head, but it's not just the Pharisees. All the forces arrayed against Jesus are coming into alignment at precisely this moment. He's traveling to the power center of the Sadducees into Jerusalem to the Temple Mount where they have their source of power. They control the temple. He's traveling into Jerusalem where, where the governor Pilate is now because it's the most important celebration of the year for the Jewish people. It's Passover. It's the one week every year when the Jews are most likely to revolt and the Romans are quickest to come down with violent force to stop it. It's hard for us to get our mind around what this week would have been like, so I want you to, to play an imagination game with me today. So imagine that rather than the history you learned about World War II, we didn't win. We lost. And not only did Germany conquer Europe and England, they conquered us. And for 70 years, we've lived under German Nazi occupation. And yet, we still celebrate the 4th of July every year, because some things you just can't get out of you. And so we still celebrate every year. And we, we spend time, we miss our old country so much that we memorize the Constitution. Who's memorized the Constitution lately? Nobody? But some, someone raised their hand. That's awesome. So... One person can memorize it. No one else has. But we all start memorizing it because we see it as the most important political document, not only in our history, in the history of the entire world. And that's how we want to frame our whole lives around the Constitution, the wisdom of the Constitution. So imagine that's how we live. And we gather week after week, because churches don't exist anymore in this world. We gather in Constitution assemblies. And we study and reflect on the Constitution. And we debate the finer points of how it should be applied if it wasn't for those terrible people who are occupying us. And that's what we do for 70 years. And then, on 1 4th of July, the premier constitutional advocate in our nation travels to Washington, D.C. with a huge crowd. And he stands on the mall between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, and he proclaims, a new America is coming. How would you feel? Can you feel your heart pumping like, yes, finally it's going to be right? How do you think the Germans would respond if they were occupying us? How, lo how long would that constitutional advocate have to get off of the mall and into hiding? They probably wouldn't get out, would they? This is the situation every single year at Passover in Jerusalem. There is always the anxiety from Rome that the Jewish people will rebel. There's the anxiety from the Sadducees who are in alliance with Rome controlling the temple that all of the pilgrims will get unruly and they'll lose their power. And everyone wonders, is this the year that Jerusalem boils over and chaos ensues? 
That's in the back of everybody's mind as Jesus, who just raised someone from the dead, is sitting in Bethany a half an hour from the gates of Jerusalem on this night. So that's the context. Enemies all around, political and religious festival full of revolutionary fervor. But for now, for this evening at least, a joyful celebration as probably Jesus' closest friends, these are peers more so than the disciples were who were 15 years younger than Jesus, his friends, he gathers with his closest friends and they celebrate the life of Lazarus. Inside the house it would look something like this. They would have gathered around a U-shaped table. It's called the triclinium meal. In those days at a fancy meal, you didn't sit at a table, you reclined at the table. There would have only been men at the table. Women would have eaten somewhere else unless they were serving the men. They would come in and out. And Jesus would have been sitting right where he is in this table. This is the seat of honor at a triclinium meal. So when you see the Lord's Supper painting stuff, he's in the center. That's not how it was. He would have been at a U-shaped table. He would have been there at the, at the, at the Lord's Supper, we know, on Thursday night. It was probably the disciple John sitting in this seat because he would lean against Jesus from that seat. And he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, and so that's probably who it was. Judas was next to Jesus because they could dip the bread in each other's bowls, so they must have been next to each other. And Peter was across the way because Jesus speaks directly to Peter from across. He was in the lowest seat, the servant's seat. This night, it was probably John still next to Jesus and then Lazarus because how could Jesus not sit next to Lazarus when he just raised him from the dead? So they're gathered around this meal. Their feet are, are splayed out behind them as they recline at the table. The women are serving them. And then Mary comes in. And she breaks open this jar of perfume. A pint of pure nard. I don't even know what nard is, but it was expensive. I, I wondered how expensive is perfume anyway, because I don't buy that sort of stuff. I checked this week. I'm sorry I don't buy that sort of stuff. I'm not very romantic, so it's just true. So, so I checked on Amazon, what's the most expensive bottle of perfume? You can get a bottle of Alfred Sung perfume. It's 1.7 ounces for $10,000. But it's not just $10,000, it's also $4.95 for shipping and handling. <laughs> and then I checked, I'm an Amazon Prime member. Can I get free shipping with, no. Amazon Prime membership does not get you free shipping on this 10,000 bottle of perfume. I think they decided if you can waste $10,000 on a bottle of perfume, you can waste $4.95 shipping and handling. It's a lot of money for, shampoo, for a little bit of perfume. The bottle Mary breaks was worth a little more than $10,000. It was worth an average annual wage in that day. So today, the comparison would be not $10,000 or $20,000, but more like $40,000 of perfume. This is the most precious thing that her family probably owns. This is crazy, isn't it? Have you ever taken $40,000 and poured it down the drain? If someone in your house did that, how would you respond? That's nuts. Don't do that. $40,000 poured down the drain while on Jesus' feet. Now, you do wash people's feet. It's good to wash them. You wash them with water, or if you're really fancy in those days, you wash their feet with oil, and it gives them a little bit of nice, pleasant aroma too, because feet can smell in those days. But you don't pour $40,000 worth of perfume on anybody's feet. You just don't do that, unless you're married. But she's not done. She pours the $40,000 of perfume on Jesus' feet, and then she does something even worse. She kneels down, and she undoes her hair, and she washes Jesus' feet with her hair. Now think about this in this day. In that day, they had robes that they wore. So when you kneel down and you have a big robe on, what happens to your robe? you got lots of extra fabric up here, right? Why not wash his feet with that? You can wash that later, and it's not your hair, right? There's something intimate about washing someone's feet with your hair, how many women are up for doing that today? Nobody, right? No one wants to do that. Who would think of that? But it's, we, we get some of the scandal that, I, in one of the commentaries you read this week, the, the writer said it's equivalent to a woman 
in our day, hitching up her dress to the top of her thighs and kneeling down in front of a man, and we'd all wonder, what in the world is going on, right? It's scandalous. In those days, rabbis told men that if your wife went outside with her hair let down, you could divorce her then and there and didn't have to pay anything because it was clearly justified because your wife went outside with her hair down because clearly she's an immoral woman. It was said of one rabbi that even the rafters of her house had never seen her hair let down. That was a way to say she was that moral and upright and righteous. Even in, inside her own home with her husband, she wouldn't let her hair down. Women did not put their hair down in front of anybody except their husband. And here she is, she puts her hair down in front of the whole crowd and washes Jesus' feet with her hair and $40,000 of perfume. The crowd's right to wonder what in the world is going on. They're right to be offended. It's an offensive act, what she's done. It's scandalous. You can imagine many of them were blushing. This is something that shouldn't be done in public. Judas finally says what all of them are thinking. You've got to be kidding me, Jesus. Stop this. That's basically what he says. It's a paraphrase. Don't let her do this. And Jesus responds by rebuking Judas with language about his burial, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. And then an odd comment about how the poor will always be among them. And I want to pause there for just a minute because I once heard in a private conversation at some pastor conference, a pastor argued that that meant we shouldn't worry about the poor because they'll always be among us. Jesus said so. I'm going to give a preview of what's coming next. That's stupid. Just think about what that would mean. That would mean what Jesus was saying is, there's so much poverty, God can't do anything about it, so why bother? Do you really think there's any problem in our world that's too big for God? Jesus didn't think so either. So what is going on? So Jesus is not just making up this line, you always have the poor among you. You're, not, you're, you're right when you think, I bet he's quoting the Old Testament. He is. He's not only quoting the Old Testament, he's quoting from the Torah, the first five books. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, where God says, you will always have the poor among you, and then God keeps talking, and we'll get to that. Deuteronomy 14 and 15 are God's laws, in many ways, about how to deal with poverty. These are some of the laws you find in Deuteronomy 14 and 15. There are laws about debts, and about how you handle land, and about generosity, and slavery, and how the community provides for the poor. So there are laws about how you have to leave the corners of your field so that the poor can gather there and feed themselves. How you can only go through the field one time when you're harvesting so the poor can follow behind and gather for themselves. There's laws about giving your tithes and offerings. It's a six-year cycle of tithes and offerings. And every third year, the entire offering and tithe goes to care for the poor in your town. It was about 20%. Tithes and offerings were more than 10. It's probably 20%, many scholars estimate, of all everything they owned went to care for the poor every three years. And then other times went to the priest and then went to the temple. There are laws about how every seven years all of the debts have to be canceled. Every 50 years you give all of the land back to the original owner. This is not about personal motivated, I feel like being generous. These are laws that ensure that people don't stay poor. There's some generosity, and you can make the edge of your field big or small, what you leave behind. But other things, you can't not give the field back after 50 years. Either you obey the law or you don't, right? And it's not personal generosity. It's legal governmental enforcement to make sure the poor get cared for. Both personal generosity and legal generosity, gover governmental intervention are involved in how God cares for the poor in the Old Testament. Both are there. So what, what is Jesus saying? In verse 7, Sorry, in Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, God says that there will never be anyone in need in their land. And then he outlines why. In verse 11, he says, you'll always have the poor among you. Therefore, he says, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. So when Jesus says, you'll always have the poor among you, everyone finishes the sentence, therefore be open-handed and generous. And it's judgment on Judas right here, isn't it? Because he's stealing money, money bags. He's not open-handed and generous. He's tight-fisted and greedy. He's judging Judas. In the Old Testament, the context would be that God knows there will always be people who are poor. They get sick and they can't work. They have a fire in their field and they lose their whole harvest. They just make a bad decision and it costs them dearly. And they have to sell themselves into slavery. 
bad things happen in life. And so God set up a legal framework to care for them. And then he also said, and then beyond what the law requires, be open-handed and generous so that among you no one stays poor. No one stays in need. That's what's going on in the text Jesus quotes. It is not a giving up. We can't do anything about poverty. It's a follow the law to make sure there's no poor people, advocate for that, and then be personally generous with what you have left as well. Both are, at, are, are in play there. So that's what Jesus, that's what's going on in that part. That's why we do things, right? That's why we do personal care pantry hand to hand because God cares about people who are struggling. We need to. That's part of why we do those things. Now let's get back to our story. We don't know why Jesus chose to anoint Jesus' feet. Maybe it was an impulsive act. Maybe it was out of gratitude for the fact that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. We don't know. Maybe she was a prophet and she knew what was coming next. Maybe. We don't know what motivated her, but we know how Jesus interpreted it because he says that she is anointing his feet to prepare him for his burial. To prepare him for the burial. In those days, when people died, you would put them in the family tomb. You'd lay them out on a table, a concrete slab. There would often be three tables, actually in the same shape as that triclinium, in a U-shape in many of the tombs. And so you could lay three bodies out at a time in the tomb, because sometimes multiple people died in a year. You would lay the body out for a year, and as you know then, bodies decompose. And after a year, you would take the, the bones, you would fold them up and put them in an ossuary, a bone box, and set the box on a shelf in the family tomb. Think about what a, that would smell like if you're in a small enclosed space that's always sealed off so there's never any wind to blow that smell away. And then for a year, the smell just accumulates before you go back inside. It would smell really bad. So when they put bodies in the tomb, they would anoint them with oil and spices and really good expensive perfume to control the smell. And Jesus says, Mary is anointing me for my burial because he knows he's going to die on Friday right before the Sabbath and they won't be able to prepare his body before it's placed in the tomb, which is true. They don't have time to do that. That's why they come on Sunday morning to prepare his body. There was no time on Friday night. Jesus sees this as preparing him already now for his burial because he knows where he's going. It's God's provision to anoint him ahead of time. So while Mary and the crowd see a potential new king in Jesus, that's the other thing the anointing could have meant. You would anoint a king with perfume or with oil, and she could have been trying to reenact that as well. They all see a potential king, as we'll see in Palm Sunday next week. What Jesus sees is a road that's leading not to a throne, but to his death, to the cross. And he's being prepared for it as she anoints his feet. What I love about this story is how it gives us a chance, though, to think about how do we respond to Jesus? There's really four different groups of people who respond to Jesus in our text. There's Judas. Judas responds to Jesus by looking to Jesus for what he can get from Jesus. I could get money in the money bag and I can take some money out of the money bag. That sounds really good. I should keep following Jesus is his logic. Most of us probably aren't that cold and calloused about it. And yet there's a part of us, if we're honest, that sometimes we follow Jesus because it works for us, right? It's convenient. We... Maybe we stay connected with our parents and we stay on their good side. Maybe we, we get, that's where all our friends are. We want to stay in that community, but it's not really about Jesus anymore. It's about our friends over there. The danger in being a pastor, let me tell you the pastor danger. So you become a pastor because you want to tell people about Jesus and you want to care for people in hard times, right? That's what motivates us, right? It's who we are. And then you become a pastor and people pay you to do those things. And they tell you what a great job you did doing those things. And suddenly, you can do those things, not because you love Jesus, but because you get paid to do those things. Or because people tell you, oh, you're such a good pastor. And suddenly, it's about you, not about Jesus. It started being about Jesus. It ends up being about you. It's not just pastors, it's Sunday school teachers. You can start teaching kids about Jesus because you love them, want them to know Jesus, but then, you know, they give you cute gifts at Christmas and they all love you so much and now suddenly it's about your ego and feeling good about you and it's not about Jesus anymore. We can start following Jesus and end up following ourselves. And when that happens, we are right where Judas is. There's two crowds as well. There's the crowd outside. 
There's the religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who when they see Jesus, they see a threat because Jesus is demanding that they change their lives and admit they don't have it all together. And they don't want to do that. They want to be in control. They want to look good. They want to keep the facade of their moral righteousness in front of them. We can be like that when we want to be the church people, right? And we stand up a little extra tall because I'm in church every single Sunday. And sometimes I go on Thursdays, Monday, Thursday. And I go on Wednesdays on Ash Wednesday. I never miss Thanksgiving. And Christmas Eve, I am there. And if they had it at night, I would be there. And I come on Wednesday nights for the dinner and I'm in, and in the classes. I'm one of those kind of people. I've got it going on when it comes to this Jesus thing. And we like to think we have it all together too. And we don't like to admit that we can doubt and we can struggle and we can fall into sin too. We can struggle with pride and jealousy of those who are more successful than us. We can struggle with anger when people don't meet our expectations. But we like to pretend we have it all together and we stand with the Pharisees, putting on a good act for the crowd. Or we can be the disciples inside. They've gathered around Jesus and they know how you respond to Jesus. They love Jesus. I mean, they've given up everything to follow him. They love him. But they know how you respond to Jesus. You do it appropriately. You do it with good measure, in proper good order. And so you, you talk about theology with Jesus over tea in the afternoon. You don't go pouring out $40,000 down the drain. That's crazy. You don't do that. You do things appropriately, with measure, in intentionality. And if we're honest, that's where most of us are most of the time, right? We love Jesus and we want to respond and we respond out of love, but we don't want to be a little crazy about it. The RCA in, our, in, our founding, in the Book of Church Order, which is kind of our polity, actually says we should do things in good and proper order. That's what elders and deacons are supposed to do. Make sure we do things in good and proper order. Does Jesus ever do anything in good and proper order? Mary doesn't respond in good and proper order. She responds with all of who she is, humiliating herself, scandalizing herself to show Jesus how much he means to her. How do you respond to Jesus? If you had to pick today, where would you be standing? Would you be standing with Judas looking out for what's in it for you? With the Pharisees trying to make sure you still look good? With the disciples wanting to be honestly a little safe and secure, not too over the top with all this? Or with Mary, willing to humiliate yourself to show Jesus how much he means to you? Where do you stand? Depending on the day, I stand with all of those people. I want to say I stand with Mary. Sometimes I do. Sometimes when we're singing about Jesus in church, I get a little excited. My kids can hear me when I'm in the back of church sometimes and they're in the front of church. Maybe you've noticed I'm a little loud. Someone told me once when they're playing with the band, they can hear me over the monitors. That's a little troubling. <laughs> sometimes you do that, right? I, honestly, I, I wonder sometimes, if you get what Jesus did, how do you not respond with all of your gusto when you're singing about it? And so I kind of do, and I apologize for the people in front of me. It's a little loud. So I'm a little loud sometimes, I know. It's kind of embarrassing if you're my kid, probably. Sometimes you do that. Other times... Like, I'll, be, I, I, I'll just talk to people in the restaurant about Jesus. By the way, that's awkward sometimes for them. Sometimes a little weird, right? Or for the person you're with. They're like, seriously, I just want to order. And you, you talk about what's going on and you pray for them. And sometimes you do that. But often, not, I, often I'm not. Often I'm the disciples. I'm like, I want to pray with you. I'm with you. But if I talk to the server, that'll be awkward and weird. And they might think I'm strange. And so I don't want to do that. And so then I, I play it safe, right? And I stand up in front of you week after week. You want to know the hardest time it is to not be a Pharisee? To be the guy up front talking about Jesus. And to admit that you don't have it all figured out yet either. Every week I struggle with being a Pharisee. And in my weak moments, I can be Judas. Last week Sunday, we were downstairs with our small group talking about, about church. And I made a comment that I didn't have anyone tell me it was a good sermon. I was feeling bad. By the way... It shouldn't matter whether you thought it was a good sermon or not, should it? It should matter if God thought it was good. It should be for God, not for you to tell me I did a good job. And as I said it, I realized, I think I'm Judas. 
I think I was preaching so people would tell me I did a good job, and I was in it for me, not for God, and I just totally failed as a pastor this morning. I can be Judas sometimes. Maybe you can too. What we can't deny today, no matter where we stand, is that Mary's response to Jesus is extravagant. A picture of Mary anointing Jesus' feet with perfume would be in the dictionary next to the word extravagant. This is what extravagant means. It's dramatic and exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. Yeah, I think Mary did that. Is it lacking in moderation, balance, or restraint? 40,000 bucks down the drain. That's not balanced or restrained. Is it extremely or unreasonably high in price? You better believe it. Is it an absurd act from a human perspective? Absolutely. But so is what Jesus does for us. No existing title we could give him would do justice to what Jesus has done for us. No introduction could be over the top, flattering, compared to what Je who Jesus actually is to us. No response we could have to Jesus could ever go far enough given what he has done for us. He's the Son of God who took on flesh and faced rejection from his best friends, was killed by his own countrymen, and suffered the most painful way a brutal dictatorship could imagine because he loved you. Can you imagine such an outpouring of love? That's the kind of love can't be stopped. It's the kind of love that overwhelms, that leaves us speechless. Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem in our text today. He knows where he's going the next day. He goes with intention. He goes on purpose. He goes to give up his life so that those who are dead could finally live. How have you responded to that gift? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gracious gift of your Son. We thank you for the mercy he has shown us, for the, the new life and hope we have found in him. We ask that where we have seen ourselves today, standing with Judas or with those opposed to Jesus or even trying to play it safe inside with the disciples, that by your Spirit you would move us forward to respond with the same kind of love you have shown us, a love that pours itself out, heart, mind, soul, and strength. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.